excited about that. Are you ready? All right. Today we're in relationship rehab, and my title is Demo Day. Demo Day. Anybody know what Demo Day is? Anybody ever watch Chip and Joanne? I never did. Renee did, and I just stared over her shoulder and watched it. But Demo Day was a day when everything got tore up. And you ever been in a marriage where you had Demo Day? Like, what just happened? We used to have a vanity, and now we just have stubs coming out of the wall. We used to have a home, and now it's all torn up. Are we supposed to live in this thing? Anybody know what Demo Day is like? Oh, Renee and I had some Demo Days in our marriage early on. Fight so long and so hard, we would just quit out of sheer exhaustion. Nobody else, but that's okay. I'm here to do what I need to do to help you. And so I think a lot of relationships are doing demo without a plan. You see, the first step to construction is always demolition. You tear up the house to fix it. You tear up the ground to build. The first step of construction is demolition. And so if you have been fighting, if you have had conflict, if you have been going back and forth, north side, look at me right now, you know what I'm talking about. If that has been your story, it's good news for you because demolition is the first step of construction. Look at your neighbor and say, Shoo. Like seriously, you ever been in a big fight and think, what just happened? All you dating people, like everything was great, and then you guys flip out on each other. What just happened? Proverbs 24 and 3, here we go. It says, a house is built by wisdom and becomes strong through good sense. Through knowledge, its rooms are filled with all sorts of precious riches and valuables. The wise are mightier than the strong, and those with knowledge grow stronger and stronger. So don't go to war without wise guidance. Victory depends on having many advisors. It's dangerous for us to go at marriage without help. We have small groups. We have people. We create the kind of environment that's very sticky so that you have somebody to be a part of you. And granted, it's also very messy at times. We've had situations where couples are having problems and the church swarms to help. And then they get divorced, and the church doesn't let go because the church is the church, and it's supposed to be sticky. And so <laughs> you've got team A versus team B, and, like, and we all love each other. But I'd rather have that than a cold, detached, unconcerned church. Somebody say amen. Many marriages fall apart due to ignorance. They're unaware that there's going to be dynamics that take place. All of our pre-marriage counseling is designed to show you your problem areas where you might have a fight. Because a lot of people will have tension in relationships and be like, I don't know what happened. I was perfect before we got married. Now I seem to have a lot of flaws. Things didn't turn out as I planned. They, I thought they were getting God's gift to the world. And instead, they seem a little annoyed at me. What's going on? So there's three stages to romance and relationships. There's move-in day. It's the early romance. Everything's on cloud nine. There's a difficult stage where repairs are needed. And then there's the mature love where your house is paid for. You got the same furniture you've had for 30 years. Got the same picture on the wall of that sliced bread. You ever see that sliced bread picture people put on the walls? Look, the honeymoon is thrilling. Renee and I went to the Florida Keys on our honeymoon. Uh, it was during Gay Pride Week. We weren't sure what was going on down there. It was a lot different than what we expected. But the honeymoon is thrilling. And I've come to pastor all the daters in the house and all the people that are interested in somebody. Do not skip courting the relational back and forth to jump to the honeymoon. Like, when you're buying a house, you can't move in until... The contract is closed. And so that's why Christians don't move in together. Hello, praise the Lord, everybody. My God. We reserve sex for post-marriage, not because it's the church, because it's God's plan. God invented marriage. It's his idea. He knows what works and what doesn't. And just because society tells you you should test drive one another with no commitments, that is a lie from hell. Sex is supposed to be between one man, one woman who are married officially, not just intended to be married, 
But this is the plan of God. And the more that you violate that, the more that your heart ends up being affected negatively by it. Preach, pastor. I'm preaching. I think I'll keep going. You go ahead. I will. <laughs> Sex is not casual. It takes your heart and joins it to that other person. I got scripture for it. Don't have time for it today. Like, Sex is not for when you make a decision about a person. I like them. Okay, let's get it on. Woo. No, that is not God's plan. Sex is not the test drive for a relationship. Sex should be and is designed by God to be the culmination of a lifelong covenant only. And sex is designed by God to intensify, solidify, to connect that relationship in ways that only a covenant can. And so, sex definitely raises the stakes in a relationship, and God intends it to. It causes the heart of a man to be bonded to the woman. And the more that you reject that, the more that it affects your soul. And so, one man, one woman... All up in the bed for life. Somebody say yes. That's God's plan. And so the devil does everything he can to get you to have sex when you're not married. And the devil does everything he can to keep you from having sex once you are married. It is anything but casual. It is intended by God. And so that's enough of that. The Song of Solomon is a book about that first stage of marriage, the infatuation stage, the it's so amazing, you're perfect to me phase. I'm going to read you Song of Solomon 1 chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 1 verse 2. <clears throat> Sit back, relax, because the love doctor's about to speak. <clears throat> verse 2, kiss me, kiss me again, for your love is sweeter than wine. Hug, hug, kiss, kiss. Little hug, little kiss, big kiss. Where my Nacho Libre people are at? Come on. Thank you. I've wanted this church for so long. Verse 3. How pleasing is your fragrance. You smell so good. Your name is like the spreading of fragrance and scented oils. No wonder... All those other girls love you. Take me with you. Come, let's run. The king has brought me into his bedroom. Young woman of Jerusalem, how happy we are for you, O king. We praise your love you more than wine. How right they are to adore you. I am dark but beautiful, a woman of Jerusalem. Dark as the tents of Kedar. Dark as the curtains of Solomon's tents. A little too racy, verse 6 and 7. We're skipping to verse 8. If you don't know, oh most beautiful woman, follow the trail of my flock. Folks, they ain't talking about livestock here. And graze your young goats by the shepherd's tents. You are as exciting, my darling, as a mare among Pharaoh's stallions. <laughs> How lovely are your cheeks. And earrings set them afire. How lovely is your neck, enhanced by a string of jewels. We will make for you earrings of gold and beads of silver. I'm going to buy you something, girl. You're so fine. Like, this is what happens in the beginning of a relationship. This is why you can't, it's hard to talk people out of love. Like, they are toxic. They are dangerous. They are, they have a criminal record. I don't care. I can change him. Why all the prison romances? Why do serial killers have a stable of women trying to connect with them? Why, why, why? Because the infatuated kind of love makes bad decisions sometimes. And so you gotta, you got to have a mindset in the beginning that puts Jesus first. So when that kind of feeling hits you hard, you don't make bad decisions. Somebody say yes. And so it's like a spellbound, absorbed, engrossed with each other. 
crush situation and you're intense about it and you think they're the best person that's ever lived. When Renee and I were dating, she would look at me and say, you're just so good. You're so good. I can't believe you're so good. You're so good. And we weren't having sex. This was me just living life with her. And she's like, you're a good man. I think you're good. Ten years into the relationship, she said some things that didn't quite line up with that. (laughs) Because the infatuation was gone. And uh, idealism is is intended when you're you're falling in love. I think God, God intended that. But look at chapter four of Song of Solomon, verse one. He goes on, he's like, behold... You are beautiful, my love. Behold, let me say it again, you are beautiful. Your eyes are like doves behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats leaping down the slopes of Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn ooze that have come up from the washing, all of which bear twins. I don't know if she had like a messed up grill, lots of teeth, I'm not sure what that means. And not one of them has lost its young. I guess he's saying they're all lined out right. Your lips are like a scarlet thread, and your mouth is lovely. Your cheeks are like halves of a pomegranate behind your neck, and your neck is like the Tower of David, built in rows of stone. On it hang a thousand shields, all of them shields of warriors. So I read for you from her hair to her cheeks to her face to her teeth to her neck, And I'm going to skip verse 5, 6, and 7 because he keeps on going. But he ends with, you are altogether beautiful, verse 7, my love. There is no flaw in you. That is how love starts. You're perfect. Everything about you is amazing. I love you so much. And you totally disregard the fact that there are differences and faults. That is what intensity and idealism in an early relationship create. And you indulge that person. I don't know. What do you want? Where do you want to go? I don't care. I'll go where you go. I've been married 25 years. We barely do that anymore. We're going here because we have a coupon. (laughs) Like you cater to every whim. It's a rare thing for people to keep pampering each other, you know, 30 years into relationship. It's beautiful. My father-in-law has it all figured out. That man has it all figured out. I watched him in fearful wonder as he sat in his chair with sweet tea in it. And as he sat there, he jiggled it. He jiggled the sweet tea with ice in it. And his wife ran into the room, my mother-in-law, who I love dearly, ran into the room and refilled the ice, the, 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 the iced tea. I know many of you hate me right now, but it really happened. It's shocking to me. This man needs to do, I said, do you do seminars? Do you do marriage I'm joking, I'm joking. But that commitment to pamper each other can fade over time. Because infatuation um, is like the first ingredient of a relationship. You're intense, you indulge them, you're infatuated, you have this feeling of everything is right in the world, the trees are luscious and green, the birds are chirping, the frogs are belching, it is beautiful bounce in your step. And from my perspective, that makes me very scared because people can make crazy decisions during that time. We're moving in together. We're, we're, we're going we're gonna to backpack across China. And Solomon, through his entire book, is writing that way. Solomon, with all those women that he had, wrote that way throughout the entire Song of Solomon. And one more word describes this phase of a relationship. Ignorance. <laughs> you don't know. It takes time to know somebody. You remember that old song that Johnny Cash sang with that girl? And it started out, we got married in a fever. Because that, that can happen. And, and marriage is not bad. And, it's, and it can be right. And I'm not against that. I am pro-marriage, pro-pro-pro-marriage. But it's dangerous to fall in love with the ideal of a person and not have enough time to know who that person is. And if you don't know what they're really like, you don't know what they're really for, right? And so in the early stages of a relationship, we ignore differences. We, endure, we, we ignore hang-ups. We, we, we sweep stuff under the carpet because we think it's going to be okay. And that stage doesn't last. Can I have an amen, somebody? 
I love how you're sitting there totally silent, darling, just perched, looking at me with a cocked head, thinking of all the things you're going to say to me when we get to the house. I love it. <laughs> Sooner or later, we walk into a couple realities, you know, that um, we have different, we are different people with different temperaments. We, we, we have different priorities sometimes. Um, there's more to life than just having fun. We got to pay bills now. <laughs> Think about your wedding day. You had rented clothes, fake tan, extra time on your hair that you never have to spend, rented jewelry. Come on, somebody. It's the fakest day of your life. And it can end up where the thrill is gone. Look at your neighbor say, the thrill is gone. Oh, you didn't say it because you don't want to believe it, but the thrill can be gone. You got to have something to carry you other than the love heebie-jeebies, right? And so the thrill is gone, love. That takes us to Proverbs 27. The same man who wrote Song of Solomon saying, your neck is like the Tower of David. Your cheeks are like fine hams. That same man that said, there's nothing wrong with you. You're great. You're fantastic. A little while in Proverbs 27, verse 15, he says, a continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome wife are alike. To get this woman to do what I want her to do is like trying to restrain the wind <laughs> or grasp oil in my hand. If you pour oil in your hand, you can barely keep it. It will seep through. If you try to restrain the wind, you're going to have a hard time because the wind is like a hurricane. It can't be stopped. The party's over. Anybody ever wake up one day and be like, what have I done? Like when I started snoring, I think Renee felt that way. It was night three of our relationship. The party's over. And the differences, the things that you're good at, the things that they're not good at, the things that you had as a silent expectation that they've never even thought of before, all of that means the party's over, the thrill is gone, there's just tension. You say, I took you for better or worse, and their response to you is, but you're a lot worse than I took you for. Here's some things that characterize the thrill is gone. Dullness. Back to the routine. Boredom can set in. You become complacent. You lose interest. You stop dating each other. In your appearance, you let it all hang out. When we got married, I didn't have nearly the back hair that I have now. And it is a commitment to keep it under control. Come on, men. Come on, men. I will come to you and call you out tonight at Bold if you don't amen me right now. I don't feel like I got a good, strong amen there. Like it just, things change over time. And when you, when, when you were dating, you looked perfect. When we were dating, I, I, I had a 32 waist. I have 32 thighs now, okay? <laughs> the attitude before marriage is anything you want. I don't know, I don't know what I want, what do you want? And after marriage, it turns into, get it yourself! That's not how marriage has to be, but this is where the tension lies. You have disagreements about how to raise kids, disagreements about how to deal with money. You begin to argue. There's strife in your, in your, in your marriage. There's, there's conflict. There's silence. There's disharmony. There's defensiveness. You start protecting yourself for the potential damage of another go-around with that person. You're not as open with your feelings and emotions as you used to be. You, you refuse to be vulnerable. There's a communication breakdown. You're protecting yourself because you think they could use whatever you give them as ammunition against you later, and we excuse ourselves and start accusing our spouses, and we blame them and find fault with each other, and resentment builds up like a big wave. And before you know it, we're protecting ourselves by just constantly disapproving of that person. <sighs> Men, what do we do? Silence. It's total silence. It's my happy place. Come on. Come on, men. Silence, my happy place. I'll just say nothing. I can go months without talking. If I wasn't married, I might go months without talking. This is a forced exercise right here. People come to my house like, you don't act like you do when you're preaching. Yeah, I'm not preaching. I'm not speaking. She can speak for me in the home, except when there's a big decision to make, and I'm definitely big daddy in the house. Don't get that wrong. But, but we get to the place where they can't do anything right. We went from everything you do is perfect, you're so good, to nothing you do is right. 
How could I marry somebody who met none of my needs? I heard an old preacher time, one time say, it will be, he had a funny way of talking, had a high-pitched voice. He said, you will find <laughs> that sometime in your life you will marry a spouse who's profoundly weak in an area you wish they would be profoundly strong in. Plenty of opportunity for nagging, criticizing, complaining. It's like, it's like they become so temperamental. 90% mental and 10% temper. That's crazy. Nagging. Nagging. Constant reminding. Nothing's good enough. Nothing makes you happy. There's just a lack of respect in the home. There's criticizing, jabs, little digs, poking fun of Constantly being critical. All of this makes us disappointed. What have I done? Who am I with? This is just like my parents. I don't want that. And people can feel cheated. They can have secret feelings of regret. Like, what have I gotten myself into? Did I make a mistake? Did I even hear from God? What if I didn't listen to my mother like I should have? Doubts and disillusionments can all come. And if you don't deal with it, it can lead you toward depression or possibly divorce. We want to stop that. God intends marriage for our sanctification. I am more like Jesus because I'm married. And I'm not saying that you can't be more like Jesus. I'm just saying God has used the woman that is closest to me the one that I love the most, to show me all the things that are not like him in our relationship. And she helps the Holy Spirit quite a bit with that along the way. And so things can go from you make me feel so great to you make me feel so bad. What is going on? Time for some rehab. Look at your neighbor and say, demo day. Most marriages never get past what I just described. Most marriages never make it past the fighting stage. Most marriages don't last more than eight years in America. They go through the honeymoon stage, they love it, they get addicted to that. A lot of people get addicted to that and want to repeat that honeymoon stage with other people over and over again. And when it comes time to do the hard work of mature relationships, they just bail and start over. And that's not God's plan for your life. We need to break through into mature love. Mature love, where the house is paid for, where the kids are stable, where where we're not, we're not fighting to be right, we're fighting to win. One of the biggest things that changed in my heart when I realized I think our marriage is maturing is that we were, we were having a discussion about something, and I said to her, I am not trying to change you, I am trying to love you. And I heard myself say it, I'm like, oh, you're killing it, you're killing it. I didn't tell her I was killing it. I just felt like I was killing it because that was really my heart. Like, I'm not trying to change you. I'm trying to love you. The Holy Spirit is the only one that can change your spouse. Jesus is the only one that can change your heart. Don't sit here and listen to me and think he's preaching at them today. That's the whole problem. I am preaching at you. I am preaching at you. I'm not preaching at them. They're not all the problem. In all marriage relationships, you are 50% right and 50% wrong about your position. And God wants you to repent, and God wants you to have the kind of peace that he gives and lead you toward a mature relationship that is spelled out in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4. It says, love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant. It's not rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable. All right, I understand that. I'm going to work on the irritableness. I promise you, I love you. Or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. This is the kind of love that just won't quit when things get hard. You cannot quit when things get hard. And men... Here's what happens over and over again. They're mad at you. And you think the only way I can make her happy is to she can have less of me. So you start avoiding her. That's not what, that's not what it works. You're living in opposite world, sir. Ladies, just talk amongst yourselves right now. Seriously, when they are mad at you all the time, the, the right answer is not for you to disappear and stay away. 
the answer for you is to seek the face of God and lead spiritually in your home through prayer. When we're having a hard time, I'm not going to her and saying, is it okay if I pray for us right now? I feel, is it, can I have your permission to lead my home? I don't do that. I say, we're going to pray because we're not getting anywhere like this. And then I get oil and I lay hands on her. No, I don't do that. We pray together and it helps. Like they won't be led. Yeah, I understand that. Like you think that in one day things are going to turn? I think you, if you're trying to get your wife to follow and you're trying to get your wife to come to peaceful terms with you again, you have to be a spiritual leader in the home, which means you need to pray and, and you need to not care if she sees you. Stop praying in the shower, start praying in the car, and start praying in the living room. I got some claps. We're all going to have to clap because of that. Seriously. Stop praying in the shower, stop praying in a car, stop praying on the toilet, and start praying in the living room. Start leading the family in prayer before meals. It doesn't have to be a lot, but you need to set a different tone because you need the return of tenderness in your marriage, and tenderness can only happen through a changed heart. And the last time I checked, the only one that promises to change our heart is Jesus. Come on, somebody. So in a mature marriage, there's tenderness in the relationship. You're careful with each other's feelings. You're tender with your husband's ego. You're tender with your wife's emotions. You realize you're on the same team. Ladies, I don't think you know how strong your voice is for your husband. Let me tell you something about a man. Every man in here, unless he's a narcissist, psychopath, sociopath, which I'm not ruling that out. I've been to this church. I'm teasing. I'm making funny jokes. No, every man wants to please a woman. Where are the men at? Huh? Every man wants to please their woman. Can I have an amen, sir? We don't know how, but we're willing to. And so if you can help him win, men like to win. If you can help him with your words, if you, can, if you can encourage him, you'll get more out of him than just hammer him. Because when you hammer a man, he's like, okay, I want to run. I don't want to be around this. I can't handle the disrespect. And so it's not, it doesn't mean that you have to become some kind of Stepford wife and be like, everything's great, everything's good. I, uh. You can have a voice, but understand that your affirmation and your praise and building that man's ego makes him more successful in life. If a, like, here's what I know. When I have wife problems, it goes to the top of my list. If she's mad at me, it makes everything bad. If she's upset with me, everything's kind of screwed up in my life, and I got to go fix that. But if she's for me and she's helping me, I need Jesus more than I need her. But I can take on a whole lot if I know she's with me and that she believes in me. That's how marriage is supposed to be. It's not supposed to be two individuals fighting it out, trying to wound each other to get what they want. It's two people deeply invested in each other, the most powerful team on earth working together to honor God, to raise a family, to build a life, and somebody says amen. <laughs> and so we are not out to destroy each other. Like, if you win, I win. If we win, we win. And so we respect, we're responsible. We accept the responsibility to do our part in the marriage. I'm never going to be as great as I need to be at garage organization and dishwasher loading, but I'm committed to the process as much as I can be. My closet will never be organized in a fashion that pleases any woman in this place. Definitely not the one I'm married to. But I'm committed to whatever I can do, okay? There's, I, and this is the other thing. Sometimes your husband has a mental block. He's not good at something that you think should be easy. And a lot of times, men, you're leaning on her to do something God never intended her to do. She is not to be the main disciplinarian of the kids. She is not to be the spiritual leader of the home. She is not to be the main breadwinner of the house. She is not to carry the financial weight of taking care of stuff. That is on you, sir. Like, I don't, oh, here we go. I have a lot of strong feelings, and I think the Bible does too, about house husbands. Like, you need to do what is needed to build a life and legacy for your children and not let other people carry you. That's nothing wrong with 
your spouse having a career, and if that's what you guys want to do, I'm not that guy at all. The kids and the family need to be the priority in all things. However, you know, unless they've won the lottery, men need to work. Men need to work, and men are supposed to like to work. Like I, and, and men need to enjoy working. Now you can have a job you hate, I get it, but you don't hate that family and you're providing for them. And so I want to tip my hat to the, all the men working a job you hate to provide for your family. God sees it, he sees your sacrifice, he's for you, and we're praying that he opens bigger and better doors for you. Amen, somebody? <laughs> but secure love looks like this. No matter what happens, we're going to make it. If you leave, can I come too? No matter what happens, we're going to make it. I love you regardless. I'm committed to you. You can count on me. I will show up. I will be your biggest fan. I will be committed to your future. I am committed to your well-being. You can count on me. And that kind of uh, security and the love of God and each other's love is what a mature relationship is built on. In that, you're truthful with each other, but you're tender. Here's the thing that I get so anxious about with people because I think a lot of folks approach relationships in life like they've got it, that they're like a masterpiece and everybody around them is a scribble drawing of like crayons. And if that is how you view the world, you're far from repentance and repentance is necessary to have mature love. I'm sorry, I'll change. James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. That's for husbands and wives. And so I've gone to Renee before and said, I've been too tough on the kids. Apologizing to your kids really, really stinks, but you got to do it sometimes. Probably more often than any of us do it. Confess your sins. We have to have an attitude and heart that's willing to repent. Somebody say amen. amen. Not one of us in here, from the guy with the mic to the person who's come for the first time, there's not one of us in here who are bigger than repenting, confessing, redoubling our faith and our commitment to Christ in the light of our failures, turning to him and asking for forgiveness, receiving his grace and moving forward. That's the beauty of the gospel. The Bible says the prayer of a righteous person has great powers and is working. A lot of relationships need rehab. You got to pray. You got to open up. You got to have trusted people. A lot of times, uh, I'll tell you, your small group can do more for you individually, and maybe even together, depending on what kind of group you're in, without you vomiting all the terrible problems in your relationship. A commitment to community and togetherness with the body of Christ will help you grow. And the Holy Spirit will orchestrate moments of extreme clarity for you in the conversations of others that may not be about you to give you the insights you need to build the kind of relationship and marriage that you can build something truly remarkable on. Our, our society has, rem, has diminished the importance of family. Our society has diminished the importance of legacy. Our society has diminished the importance of manhood. Our society has diminished the importance of, uh, of, of, of a wife being protected, cared for, and provided for by her husband. The whole I don't need a man movement is going to leave you heartbroken and frustrated. So we just want to honor God in all things. And so we need to end the blame. We need to end the sulking and the pouting. We need to end the threatening to walk out. We need to end the sarcasm and ridicule. We need to quit trying to change our partner. Listen, repent, pray, invite the Holy Spirit into your house. You're, you're, you're constantly playing media that doesn't honor God. It's, it's, it's all over the house. There's tension anyway. You're trying to raise kids. You're trying to put food on the table. You're trying to do the right thing. You're trying to honor God. The atmosphere of the home is essential to be pointed toward God. 
So examine the music, examine the entertainment, examine the rhythm of your home. Because once you start praying in that home, it'll start bringing all that stuff to the surface. So it's time for us to grow. And here's the thing. Don't hear this message and think you're going to go home to a completely different reality. Change is rarely instant in a person. I don't trust it when it's instant, usually. And beyond that, growth occurs like it does in nature as a tree grows. It takes time, but as you look back over the years, you'll see major growth. You need a marriage that will last. Faith, hope, and love will last. Build your life on those things. Faith in Christ, hope in each other, hope in God, and love that is tied up in Christ. The Bible says a threefold cord is not easily broken. It's true in ropes. It's true in marriage. You must have the common thread of the Lord Jesus being at the center of your relationship. In that, it gives you a higher cord of appeal. You quit appealing to each other to change. You start talking to God about the need to change. And he does things you can't do on your own. And so, I feel like the Holy Spirit's in the room right now. Let's all stand. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Sweet, holy presence of God. Every, every head bowed, every eye closed. I feel your spirit in this room, God. I feel your presence here. There are hearts that are open. People have come to the place where they realize, oh, God, I need your help. This is your moment right here, right now. Lift up your hands to heaven. Let me pray for you as you receive. Spirit of the living God, I call upon you now for your wisdom and strength, God. There's brokenness in all of us, Lord, and you're the only healer we can turn to. There's weakness in all of us, and you're the only one that makes us strong. There's divisions in all of our hearts, but you're the only one that makes us whole. There's conflict in our home, and you're the peace keeper, and you're the one who speaks peace. There's lusts and temptations that we're struggling with, God. There's divisions that we're embracing that we need to let go. There's temptations that have come and we have succumbed to those things, God. We're repenting of those things right now and asking you to be the center of our life, the focus of everything, God. Help men to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Help wives to submit to their husbands and everything and help us both to submit to Christ. And for those that are single, God, Lord, I pray you'd prepare our hearts for the person that you have for us. Let it be for your glory and let love rule our homes. Let the spirit of God direct our footsteps. Let the power of God be real in our lives in Jesus' name. And now you can put your hands down. Still remain with your head bowed and your eyes closed. There are people in this room that have not given their life to Christ. You are not saved. You are far from God today and you need to be raised up to life in Christ. And I'm gonna give you an opportunity to make things right with God for him to give you a new heart, for you to be led by the Spirit, for your salvation to be a sure thing, not a big question. And so if you need to make that right part of your, if you need to make that part of your life right with God right now, we're gonna pray as a whole body. And I want you in sincerity and hope in faith to give your life to Christ.